in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God in me. So, Christos Anesti. When the church is gathered after the Feast of the Resurrection, definitely it's very joyous, even we call it the 50 joyous days of the year, because we are celebrating every day, not an event. What, let me ask you one question. What is the meaning of celebrating Christmas or Easter or Ascension in the church? What does it mean? Change the tunes of the songs? Or you are changing the fraction at the end of the liturgy? What does it mean to celebrate any feast whatsoever? What does it mean to celebrate any feast in the church? Did you celebrate the feast before in the church? <laughs> yes. Volunteers. Yes, Richard. Yes, this is the most important thing. If we are not reliving the event, we are not here to hear about the history of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's about the life. That's why the Coptic year, we call it liturgical year. What does it mean, liturgical year? The church is living the whole life of Christ all over the whole year. Not to commemorate the life of Christ, but to relive the life of Christ. And we have different cycles. Every morning, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Every day. And then there is a certain time, 50 days, we celebrate the whole resurrection of Christ. Every third hour, we celebrate the Pentecost. And the church is living this life of Pentecost. So again, when we focus in the church, we are focusing on to relive the life of Christ, which to hear the story of Christ. I am sure you heard the story many, many times when you were young. So our series today will start with victory over death and demons. Every time when we meet, let us do two things. We learn something, and then we enjoy the practice of this thing. So the part of, first part is teaching, second part is how to receive the message or the preaching of Christ. So let me share with you one statement. It's very, very, very famous. It's by a saint from the West, Saint Prosper. It's three Latin statements, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, Lex Vivendi. What does it mean in a very simple way? Lex in Latin means law. The law of worship is the law of belief, is the law of life. And this is the biggest stumbling block to anyone coming from outside. We are the community of love, but we are not accepted. What does it mean? It's a blasphemy against what we believe. We say in the liturgy, for example, make us all worthy to partake of this communion. Why? To be one body and one spirit. But I hate my sister and I hate my brother. I'm praying something, but Lex Vivendi, I'm living something totally different. What you are trying to ex explain today, how to live the resurrection, how to pray the resurrection. Because if I'm not praying the resurrection, or my prayer about the resurrection is different <coughs> from my understanding to the resurrection, to my behavior, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15, we are found false witnesses to God. I'm saying Christos and Esti 100 times a day, but I'm a false witness of the resurrection itself. So St. Prosper died 455, just four, four years after the uh, first schism. Hear what he says. Let us consider the sacraments of priestly prayers, the law of prayer, which having been handed down by the apostles are celebrated uniformly throughout the whole world in every Catholic church so that the law of praying Lex Orandi, might establish the law of believing, Lex Credendi. And if both of them are compatible with my way of life, I'm a real Christian. If I'm praying something, believing something else, living something different, I'm a false witness to Christ. So you are here to relive, to be true witness to Christ. Here our verse, let us unpack it to see how, how we are going to pray it, how we are going to 
believe it and how you are going to experience. Saint Paul says in First Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 54 to 57. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal is talking about our bodies, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, this is swallowed up in victory. He said many times, and all of us, the only fact in our life, we are going to die. But what is next? Unless I have the assurance of what is next, I'm always troubled, afraid of death, afraid of sickness, afraid of any weakness, because I'm not sure what is next. So this is swallowed up in victory. Oh, this, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of this is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So now he's telling us two victories here. This is defeated, and sin, which caused this, also is defeated. So our title, the resurrection, is victory over death first and over the demons, which means I am victorious in my daily walk. Then he added, but thanks be to God who gives us, us, to hear it or to practice, is to practice, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's good news, but is it my new reality or not? Let us unpack what St. Paul said here. The second thing we are going to learn, besides Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, Lex Vivendi, is whenever the church fathers are talking about any topic in the life of Christ, they start from the creation. Without starting from the creation, I'm talking about something irrelevant. Why? Because it started from the middle of the story. So let us go hand by hand with the Word of God and St. Sanchez and St. Cyril and to see how they explained it to us, how to worship with the same meaning and how to enjoy the new life that has been present. St. Cyril, in his commentary on the Gospel of St. John, chapter 7, verse 37 to 39, is telling us this is the beginning. In day one, <coughs> when God created Adam, he breathed is his nostril in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. St. Cyril is telling us this is the Holy Spirit. The main difference between man and any other creature, man received the Spirit of God. We'll see it in a minute. St. Asensio is telling us to be created as humans, animals, birds, it's a general grace. To be created out of nothing is a grace from God. Then there is additional risk only given to man that he is the only creature who received the Holy Spirit and he received the image and likeness of God. Are you with me so far? Man is the only creature received two graces. General grace to be created out of nothing. Additional grace to receive the breath of God which makes him in the image and likeness of God. Then there was, a, there was a warning. God was warning Adam, but if of the trees of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Is it a sentence or is it a warning? Sometimes we feel, he didn't say, whenever you think to eat from it, I will kill you. He didn't say, I will kill you. But he said, surely you will die. It's a warning. And this warning is out of love. But the beginning is, I give you a special grace. Then he is adding, in 319, he did it, unfortunately. So he was telling them in 319, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Again, we are here to learn and to apply. First of all, man was a very special creature. He received two graces, created out of nothing, general grace. Additional grace, he was created in the image and likes of God, and he received the Holy Spirit. The fall, there is a warning, out of love, if you shall eat from this, you will die. So now, we all born to die. We lost this additional grace. So Christ came mainly to do this. 
How we pray this, how the fathers explain this, this is what we are going to see in a minute. Here is the summary of it in one paragraph by St. Athanasius. Let us read it together and stop to see what we read in the Bible, how to summarize in one paragraph by St. it. He set them in his own paradise. This is the creation. And laid upon them a single prohibition, one commandment. If they guarded the grace and retained the loveliness of their original innocence, then the life of paradise should be theirs without sorrow, pain, or care, and after it, the assurance of immortality in heaven. Let us stop here. So was the paradise an end place or a final place for them? No. Then you know what he is saying? And after it, the assurance of immortality in heaven. There was another elevation. This is the original design. This is the original plan. Man created with two graces. General grace to be created out of nothing. Additional special grace that he was receiving the image and likeness of God and the Holy Spirit. If he will keep it, he will remain in paradise without pain. And then, additionally to this, he will be rewarded. And after it, it, the, after it the assurance of immortality in heaven. Did Adam achieve the original design according to St. Athanasius? No. So again, it's, we say it in the liturgy of St. Gregory, I brought to myself the sentence of death. It's not someone killed me, I brought it to myself. Then he added, but if they want, went astray and became vile, throwing away their birthrights of beauty, then they would come under the natural law of this. Why? So everything is created out of nothing, it ends up to nothing, except those who receive the additional grace, the breath of God. So he's telling them, you have two options. Either you remain like any other creatures, animals, bears, whatever it is, they are crazy out of nothing and they end up to, to, to nothing. But if you accept and keep what I have given you as additional grace, you will remain in paradise with the assurance to live immortality in heaven at a certain time. Now the plan has been destroyed. Let us again go with Saint Athanasius. Then they would come under the natural law of this if they will lose the additional grace and live no longer in paradise, but dying outside of it, continue in this and in corruption. And this is all what we inherited from Adam. Does anyone have doubt that he is going to die at one point? Why? Because we lost the additional grace, as Saint Athanasius was saying. But because you have given a special grace, here again, Saint Athanasius is summarizing it. He gives them two things. That is why the Holy Scriptures tells us, proclaiming the command of God, of every tree that is in the garden, thou shalt surely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, but in the day you shall do it, you will do it, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. Not just die only, but remain in the state of this and of corruption. This is on the Incarnation, chapter 3. Again, why you are reading it? Because the, the three words, what we were, the law of worship is the law of belief, and in the same time is the law of life. Why Christ was incarnated? Why Christ was incarnated? Hmm? To forgive us our sins, right? Right or not right? But not only. From what we are reading now, when we shrink the whole acts of Christ only for to forgive us of sins, as if we are taking one full book and we have said one page is enough. He's trying to tell us every single thing Jesus did was for our sake. This is what we pray in the creed, who for us men and for our salvation he became man up to his second coming. So why I am minimizing it to only one thing? He took what is ours and gave us what is his. <coughs> right? What is ours? Our life. And give us his life. 
when minimize it to my sin and his righteousness, it's too small to the great work that Jesus has done. So, we said what we believe is what we worship, what we pray. Here, I'm sure you know the words by heart. O oh God the great and the eternal who formed man in in, based on what? The additional grace. I received the power of the image and likeness of God. I received the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not like any other creature. I have the incorruptibility which none of any other creation received it. So what happened? And this which entered into the world through the envy of the devil. So it's alien. This is alien to our original design. What is going to happen? You have destroyed by the life giving manifestation of your only good. Why he was incarnate? Number one, here, to destroy death. When you miss out what we pray, or miss out the whole message. Are you with me, Shabbat? Why he was incarnate? To destroy death. Because he is our enemy. Then, we say it again in the same liturgy of St. Basil. Holy, 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 indeed, O Lord our God, who formed us, created us, and placed us in the paradise of joy. What happened? When we disobeyed your command, when we broke the law, by the deception of the serpent, we fell from eternal life. We became mortal once more. We lost the additional grace. We lost or we distorted the image and likeness of God. So I need someone to restore me once more to life and to eternity. And we're exiled from the paradise of joy. So when we start from the creation, we see why he is risen. See why he died. Why he ascended into heaven. Let me ask you this question, which is related to what we are saying as a teaching, but not to the victory over this. Why Christ is ascending to the, to, to the heaven uh, after 40 days? I'm sure you know. Please share what, what you know with me. Why Christ is going to be ascended after 40 days from his resurrection? Hmm. To prepare a command. What else? The same thing, Shabbat. And we read now in St. Athanasius, the original plan is you stay in paradise if you keep the commandment and then there is an assurance you will go to heaven for immortality. What happened? We missed out. Christ came to restore what we lost in Adam and even to continue and to complete what Adam was not able to fulfill. Without it, that's why, unfortunately, the Feast of Ascension is on a Thursday. Thursday, most of people are working and no one is attending it. So we feel it's a minor feast. It's one of the major feasts of the Lord. Without it, we have no place in heaven. He went to prepare a place and he went to be a forerunner, to took our humanity, to take our humanity and to open the place for the first time for humanity to dwell there. Again, what we believe is what we pray, is what and how we live. So St. Basil, and now we see that, that what we are praying every day in the liturgy is what St. Athanasius said and what is required for the one of every one of us. Till now, we are trying to find out what is the meaning and why he is risen, why he died. Because originally, the issue is, according to St. Cyril, in one sentence, the whole theology of the church. Death is the problem. Sin is the disease. Salvation is a process. Again, death is the problem. Sin is the disease. Salvation is the process. And we are in this process, every liturgy, every confession, every time you open your Bible, every time you pray at home or in the church. Here let us see again how the church is worshiping what she is looking for from Christ. In the narrative of the institution, Abuna is saying, he instituted for us this great mystery of godliness for being determined to give himself up to this for the life of the... Why? Because the problem was death. Yes, sin is the disease, but still the problem is we are dead. 
You notice in the Great Friday, we have two homilies by St. Athanasius. One after the third hour, second one after the eleventh hour. The first one after the third hour is telling us, Christ came to die for us, to raise us from our death because we were dead. After his resurrection, in the second homily, in the eleventh, eleventh hour, we say, now the dead are risen. Can we heal them from any disease? Yes. But you can't heal a dead person. So the church starts with the sacrament of baptism. I have to die and to rise with Christ. Then the whole journey of life is a whole journey of healing. Can, but you cannot heal someone who is already dead. Again, the fraction was that we prayed during the 50 days. This is he who descended into Hades, abolished the power of this. Again, why he is risen? To abolish the power of this for me. Let captivity captive and give honors to men. He lifted his saints up with him and gave them as gift to his father. Let us see part of Lex Vivendi, how to apply. Can you see yourself as the gift of the son to the father? Can you see yourself as such? And the price was the blood of the lamb. He says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, you were slain and redeemed us to the Father by your blood. You are the personal gift of the Son to the Father, and the prize was the life of the Son. And more than that, it's not only about you, it's about everyone else. Can you see everyone <coughs> around you? He is the gift, or she is the gift <coughs> of the Son to the Father, and the prize was the life of the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the power of the resurrection. Um, anybody around you can tell you that you worth nothing. Only the son and only the father see your value. Well, by the way, it's not about how people are going to judge you or to value you. It's how much already paid for your freedom. Maybe I feel I'm worth nothing. But if already the son paid his life to purchase me, to be a personal gift to the father, and again, this is the prayer of the church. It's not a contemplation anymore. He says, he lifted his saints up with him, gave them as gift to his father through his tasting of this for us. Why are you going to the cross? I'm going to buy in person. We see it in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. He didn't test this for the world. He tested this for everyone. Yes, he died for the whole world, but in the same time, he died for Everyone, in person. That's why he continued. Through his testing of death for us, he saved those who are alive and he both those who have died. And we, too, who were sitting in darkness for a season, he granted us the light of his resurrection through his holy incarnation. Why you brought incarnation here? Because again, when the church fathers are teaching us, <coughs> this starts always <coughs> from creation, whole, <clears throat> and how we have been restored, and how the whole life of Christ is presented and offered to each one of us. We are not here to celebrate only the resurrection, celebrating the whole life of Christ, and we are honoring today the resurrection, not above the others, just the focus of our eyes today is the resurrection. But can we have resurrection without incarnation? Definitely not. Can we have resurrection and say it's enough, we don't need ascension? Definitely not. That's why let me ask you one question. Why the Lord said in John 16, 7, it's better for you to go. Because if I will not go, I will not send the Holy Spirit. But if I will go, I will send him. Why is it better that Jesus has to go? Your theological thoughts. Why it is better for us that Jesus has to go and send the Holy Spirit? Why he didn't send it upon the cross? Why he didn't send it while he was in the, in the flesh before even going to the cross? Why? Hmm. So can you answer wrong this question? Answer, don't be shy. <laughs> Say wrong answers, please. 
complementary. What else? Yes. But he is saying it's better for you. How come it's better that Jesus will live through his death, death and resurrection and to send the Holy Spirit? The key is very simple. The Lord said in John 16, 14, 16, 14, LA, He will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine. That's why I said He will take what is mine and declare it to you. Give you let me give you one example and then rethink of it. It might be something missing from me today. St. Peter was, was the Lord on the Last Supper, right? Immediately after the Last Supper, what he did? He denied the Lord. He was beside the cross from afar on Friday. But he didn't receive the power of the cross. He saw the empty tomb on Sunday morning, and he went and locked himself. There is no power over the direction. In the evening, all of them were gathered and locked themselves in the upper room, afraid. Did Jesus risen? Yes. He is risen, but I'm still afraid. After a few days, he appeared once more on the following Sunday, which is Thomas Sunday. Then all of a sudden, Peter said, I'm going to fish. What happened? The story has yani, already done. I have nothing to do. But immediately on, sun, uh, on Pentecost, since Sunday is the Pentecost, everything has been changed. What is the difference between the Pentecost Sunday before and after? What happened? Hmm? The Holy Spirit, what, what was the work of the Holy Spirit on that day? He took what is His and declared it to us. On the day of Pentecost, St. Peter started to experience the power of his death, the power of his resurrection. He was hiding himself. Now I am boldly speaking about thousands of people. From where you got this power? It's the power of his resurrection. Without the Holy Spirit, I hear about I know the story. Did anything change in the mind of St. Peter about the story itself? He was an eyewitness from day one. But what has been changed, the Holy Spirit converted this story into power, into a revelation. Now every single thing Jesus has done, all, he will declare what is mine. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So we all know the story. We all know that he is risen. But unfortunately, not all of us living the power of the resurrection. Maybe I am missing the Holy Spirit. Yes, I was baptized and received it. But are you believing in what you have received or not? That's why <coughs> when the church is praying this fraction for at least the first 40 days or the 50 days, the church is assuring us, see your new reality. You are not the weak person who was before receiving the Holy Spirit. You are not the person who was always defeated with no power of his resurrection. So if we unpack the very first verse, this has been swallowed up into victory for me. Not in the story that we used to hear in the church, but on a personal level. Hear what the Lord said in John chapter 11, when he was confronted before death, the death of a close friend, Lazarus. He said, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Was it only for Lazarus or for you and me as well? When we read the Bible and say, I know that he said this to Martha when she was talking about, then it's not mine. Every single thing is written for me. This is the belief of the church to the point Sincere was commenting on the event of the transfiguration. Who saw the transfiguration? Who was with Jesus in the transfiguration? What is transfiguration? <laughs> three people. Yes. Those three people, Saint Cyril says, they were representing humanity. So if one person experiences this power, it's the wealth of the whole body. 
Yes, it is written that three only witness the transfiguration. It's only Lazarus who was raised from this after four days, or at least it's the only encounter we have in the Bible. But this power is ours. And if I'm not enjoying it, I'm just watching the great story of the great Savior. I'm here to experience and to relive, as we said in the beginning. St. Peter is telling us something in his first epistle, and we need to think of it for a moment. We saw how the church is worshiping God with the proper meaning of resurrection. We saw what is a need of the resurrection from day one, because from day one we are designed to be mortal, immortal. Sorry, We brought immortality, mortality to ourselves. We choose to die. Christ came to restore us to life once more. And here, focus on this verse because I will ask you. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according his, to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What is the meaning of living hope? Is there a dead hope? Actually, living hope? What is the meaning of living hope? Hope with trust. Hmm? Hope with trust. Mm -hmm. Hope with trust. What else? Yes, there is, unfortunately, dead hope. When it's just news, even if it's good news, unless you interact with this good news, it's just the news. If you are watching now the news and you heard a certain team playing a certain sport, won uh, a cup or whatever it is, and you are not interested in this sport at all. It's just news. It's good for some people, but not for me. I'm not yani, a fan of this game. The same thing. We come to church, we hear the same good news. But for me, it's, it's news. Maybe good for you, but not good for me. That's why when St. Peter and St. Nicholas has begotten us, it's the new life you have, or new life offered you, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What is this living hope? I'm, I'm becoming an eternal person. This shall never have reign over me anymore. We say it every day in the litany of the departed, for there is no death for your servants, but a departure. Do you believe it? I'm moving and I'm promoted, elevated to another world. It's not the meaning of this. The death now becomes the gate of the entrance to paradise. The world is still calling it death. The church saying he departed to paradise. Is it joyful news? If yes, why are we crying in every funeral, for example? Sometimes we say we believe in the resurrection. Definitely we are humans. We miss the loved one who died. Like, and do we see the second dimension of it? Or just we lost a person we used to love and that's it? Here is much greater news. St. Paul, he three times is telling us it's time to practice what you believe. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Do you believe the spirit of God dwells in you? Do you believe? Yes. See what is next. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. But if dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit raised Christ from death? He is the same Spirit lives in you. He is the same Spirit who is able to give you life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit. That's why the journey of the Holy Spirit, not only to be declared now, it is still the second coming. Who is going to raise us in the second coming? It's the Holy Spirit. Who is going to make us eternal? It's the Holy Spirit who is going to dwell in us eternally. That's why the journey of victory is Trinitarian. The Father sent his Son, his Son restored us once to life, and the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and make it yours, or declare it to you. Are you with me? Okay. One more thing. 
in First Corinthians chapter 15, one of the best, or not best, one of the most clear chapters of resurrection is First Corinthians chapter 15. If you can read it tonight, it will be good. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does it mean of the word first fruit? How you understand the word first fruit? Firstborn. Firstborn is the first one. So he's telling us Christ is the first fruit. Who is the second? Who is the third? This is the church. So he's telling us if you believe that this first fruit is yours. That's why even in the song or the praise of Saint Anthony, we say in the church of the first fruit. All of us are invited to be firstborns with Christ. Is a forerunner, St. Peter, St. Uh, Paul, in twice, in 1 Corinthians 6 and in Hebrews chapter 6, saying Christ is a forerunner, is the first one to enter into the heaven, is the firstborn who is telling us, I open the door, come and follow me. Become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since by man came this, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. This is not only a belief, it's a, a way, way of worship and newness of life. But I am still weak. Weak without him. But in him, I am risen. That's why St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, who raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So he didn't do anything to say, I can do it, you can't. I'm making everything for your sake. And here again, the words of St. Cyril. This is not in the liturgy. Those who have a sure hope, guaranteed by the Spirit, that they will rise again, here is very important, lay hold of what lies in the future as though it were already present. I'm not going to be risen in the future. I'm experiencing the power of resurrection from now. Against sin, against death, against whatsoever, because the risen Lord is victorious about everything. If our title is victory over this, and victory over demons, victory in general. Christ is the victorious Savior who gained everything for the losers, which me and you. He's telling us from now on, no more defeat. That's why in Colossians chapter 2, St. Peter, St. Paul was telling us, here is the great news for you. Here is the great news in a personal level. He's saying, and you being dead in your trespasses. Are you still dead? It's your choice. It's my choice. Being dead in your trespasses and the uh, uncircumcision of your flesh, you had made alive together with him. Why are you making this victory? I see you are defeated, but not anymore. We are all, we were dead. And now it's time to enjoy our newness of life. Having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it on the, to the cross. Verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, your enemy has been disarmed. You see your victory. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. It's my choice. Either I'm being dead in my trespasses, or and you being dead in your trespasses, and answer completion of your flesh, he made alive together with him. It's a choice. It's good news, but unless you enjoy it, unless you relive it, it's just news. That's why the church is the church of victory. Because our Savior won the victory for all of us. What is going on now in heaven? I am too far from God. Do you have communion today? Yes, but I am still too far. How come? And this is what the church father called it, the manifestation, the liturgy, 
your communion is the manifestation of the heavenly altar. Let us focus on this statement and read this couple of verses and to see what source of power, who is the source of power and how I receive this source of power. Hear what St. Paul says in Hebrews chapter 9. Therefore, he is comparing the tabernacle of the Old Testament of, to what we have now in the church. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things, the altar in heaven, sings themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places for himself, by himself, for himself alone. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself to show off, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Where are you standing now? I'm in the presence of the Father because I choose to be united with the Son. How close you are, it's as close as you believe. How far you are, it's you are far as you disbelieve. But the reality is the church now, you remember in the Old Testament, the high priest used to put 11, sorry, 12 precious stones naming the 12 tribes. And he put them again in his two shoulders to be before God, holding the old Israelites. Christ is not doing it in this superficial way. He's uniting all of us to be living members of his body. Where are you going to be? Um, appearing before the Holy Father for you. It's not theory. It's not nice contemplation. It's a reality. And it's up to you. Either to use this and to relive this power of the resurrection, or you are just hearing about goodness. Let me finish with you again. The, the theology of our church is Eucharistic theology. It's always related to the liturgical prayer and liturgical acts. Let me share this last quote, and I will finish. Here what St. Cyril of Alexandria is telling us. Again, if you believe it, it's yours. If you say it's nice, it will remain nice. <laughs> Hear what he said. Just as by melting two candles together, you get one piece of wax. Do you believe this? Yes. So, one who receives the flesh and the blood of Jesus is fused together with him by this communion, and the soul finds that he is in Christ, and Christ is in him. Where are you now? appearing before the Father in Christ, in heaven. If you believe that this fusing makes you one with Christ. So it's not a good habit to have communion. It is the reality of the being in union with Christ, Christ in you, and, Christ, and you are in Christ. So the whole victory is not something I will throw at you. It's always through union being united to the victorious one. Why, St. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Have you been there? You didn't see Christ in flesh. You saw him later in a vision. But he believes that every single gift is real. And it's my choice. Either to believe it, to pray it, and then to enjoy the fullness of its power. Resurrection is not an event in history. Resurrection is a newness of a beginning the whole acts of Christ. It's not only his birth divided the history, his life divided the history of humanity. And it's my choice. Either to relive it or to hear it. And I say it's a nice story or a real story that I need to relive it every day, the whole day. And glory be to God forever and ever. Any questions?